All right, folks, I have a really important and special book for you that I'm going to start reading today. It's called Number the Stars, and it's about a really, really terrible time in the history of our world called the Holocaust. You may have noticed there's this gold-looking medal on the front. That's because this book is a Newbery Award-winning book. That means that of all the books that were written for young people that, the year that this one was written, this one won the prize as the best book that year. And I think you'll agree it is a fantastic book. Chapter one of Number the Stars, and it's called, Why Are You Running? I'll race you to the corner, Ellen. Anne Marie adjusted the leather pack on her back so that her school books were balanced evenly. Ready? She looked at her best friend. Ellen made a face. <laughs> no, she said. You know I can't beat you. My legs aren't as long. Can't we just walk down the street like civilized people? She was a stocky 10-year-old, unlike lanky, tall Anne Marie. We have to practice for the athletic meet on Friday. I know I'm going to win the girls race this week. I was second last week, but I've been practicing every day. Come on, Ellen, Anne Marie pleaded, eyeing the distance to the next corner of their Copenhagen street. Please? Ellen hesitated. Then she nodded and shifted her own rucksack against her shoulders. Oh, all right, ready, she said. Go, shouted Anne Marie, and the two girls were off racing down the residential sidewalk. Anne Marie's silvery blonde hair flew behind her, and Ellen's dark pigtails bounced against her shoulders. Wait for me, wailed little Kirsty, left behind by the two older girls who weren't listening. Anne Marie outdistanced her friend quickly, even though one of her shoes came untied. As she sped along the street, past the small shops and cafes of her neighborhood here in Northeast Copenhagen, laughing, she skirted an elderly lady in black who was carrying a shopping bag made of string. A young woman pushing a baby carriage moved aside to make way. The corner was just ahead. Anne Marie looked up, panting as she raced to the corner. Her laughter stopped though and her heart seemed to skip a beat. Halt, ordered the soldier's stern voice. The German word was so familiar to Anne Marie, but it was still frightening. Anne Marie had heard it often enough, but it had never been directed at her until now. Behind her, Ellen also slowed down and stopped. Far, far back, <clears throat> little Kirsty was plodding along, her face in a pout because the girls hadn't waited for her. Anne Marie stared up. There were two of them. That meant two helmets, two sets of cold eyes glaring at her, and four tall, shiny boots planted firmly on the sidewalk, blocking her path home. It also meant two rifles gripped in the hands of the soldiers. Anne Marie stared at the rifles first. Then finally, she looked up into the face of the soldier who had ordered her to halt. Why are you running? The harsh voice asked. His Danish was very poor. Three years, Anne-Marie thought with contempt. Three years they've been in our country and they still can't even speak our language. I was racing with my friend, Anne-Marie answered politely. We have races at school every Friday and I want to do well, so... Her voice trailed off and she didn't finish the sentence. Don't talk too much, she told herself. Just answer their questions, that's all. She glanced back. Ellen was standing motionless on the sidewalk a few yards behind her. Farther back, Kirsty was still sulking, walking slowly toward the corner. Nearby, a woman came to a doorway of a shop and stood there, silently watching. One of the soldiers, the tall one, moved toward Anne Marie. Anne Marie recognized him as the one that she and Ellen had always called, in whispers, of course, the giraffe, because he was so tall and had a long neck that extended from his stiff collar. He and his partner were always standing on the corner. He prodded the corner of her backpack with the stock of his rifle. Anne Marie trembled. What is in here? He said loudly. From the corner of her eye, Anne Marie saw the woman in the doorway slip back inside her shop and shut the door. School books, Anne Marie said. Are you a good student? The soldier asked. He seemed to be making fun of her. Yes, she said. What is your name? Anne Marie Johansson. Your friend, is she a good student too? He was looking at Ellen. Ellen still hadn't moved. Anne-Marie looked back, too, and saw Ellen's face, which was usually rosy-cheeked, was pale, and her dark eyes were wide open. Based on what they've told us, we can infer that Ellen is afraid. She's pale, 
and her eyes were wide open, and she's standing back away from everything. Anne Marie nodded to the soldier. She's better than I am. What is her name? Ellen. And who is this? He said, looking to Anne Marie's side. Kirsty had appeared out of nowhere and was scowling at everybody. Now a scowl is angry look. My little sister. She reached down for Kirsty's hand, but Kirsty, who was always stubborn, refused it and put her hands on her hips defiantly. The soldier reached down and stroked her little sister's short, tangled curls. Stand still, Kirsty, Anne Marie thought, praying that somehow her stubborn five year old sister would get the message. But Kirsty reached up and pushed the soldier's hand away. Don't, she said. Both soldiers began to laugh. They spoke to each other in rapid German that Anne Marie couldn't understand. She is pretty like my own little girl, the tall one said in a more pleasant voice. Anne Marie tried to smile. Go home, all of you. Go home and study your school books and don't run. You look like hoodlums when you run. The two soldiers turned away. Quickly, Anne Marie reached down and grabbed her sister's hand before Kirsty could resist. Hurrying the little girl along, they went around the corner. In a moment, Ellen was standing right beside her. They walked quickly, not speaking, with Kirsty between them toward the large apartment building where they lived with their parents. When they were almost home, Ellen whispered, I was so scared. Me too, Anne Marie whispered back. As they turned to enter the building, both girls looked straight ahead toward the door. They did, they did it on purpose so that they wouldn't catch the eyes or the attention of the two other soldiers who stood there with their guns on this corner as well. Kirsty scurried ahead of them, hurrying through the door, chattering about the picture she was bringing home from kindergarten to show Mama. For Kirsty, the soldiers were just a normal part of life. There on the corner, as always, not any more important than lamppost. Are you going to tell your mother? Ellen asked as they trudged up the stairs. I'm not. My mother would be upset. No, I won't either, Anne Marie said. Mama would probably just scold me for running in the street. She said goodbye to Ellen on the second floor where Ellen lived, and then she continued up onto the third floor where she lived, and she was practicing in her mind the kind of cheerful greeting she might give to her mother. She'd tell her about the spelling test where she'd done really well, but as it turned out, she was too late. Kirsty had already gotten there. And he poked Anne Marie's backpack in the, with his gun and he grabbed my hair, Kirsty said, chattering as she took off her sweater. But I wasn't scared. Anne Marie was, and Ellen too, but not me. Mrs. Johansson jumped up quickly from her chair by the window where she'd been sitting. Mrs. Ross and Ellen's mother was sitting in the other chair. They were having coffee together like they did lots of afternoons. Of course, it wasn't really coffee, but their mothers called it that, having coffee. There was no real coffee in Copenhagen, and there hadn't been since the beginning of the Nazi occupation. Not even real tea. The mothers sipped at hot water flavored with herbs. Anne Marie, what happened? What's Kirsty talking about? Mother asked anxiously. Where's Ellen? Mrs. Rawson said with a frightened look on her face. Ellen's in your apartment. She didn't know that you were here. Don't worry, it wasn't anything. It was just the two soldiers who stand on the corner of the street. You know, the one who's really tall and has a long neck, the one that looks like a giraffe. She told her mother and Mrs. Rawson about what had happened, trying to make it sound funny and not important. But their uneasy looks didn't change. I slapped his hand and yelled at him, Kirsty said. No, she didn't, Mama, Anne Marie told her mother. She's just exaggerating like she always does. Mrs. Johansson went over and stood beside the window and looked out. The Copenhagen neighborhood was quiet. It looked the same as always. People coming and going from the shops, children playing, soldiers on the corner. Mama spoke to Ellen's mother in a quiet voice. They must be edgy because of the latest resistance incidents. Did you read in the Free Dane about the bombings? Although Anne Marie pretended to be looking at her schoolwork, she listened closely to what Mama said. She knew that the newspaper, the Free Danes, was an illegal newspaper. Peter Nelson brought it to them every now and then, carefully folded up and tucked into some books. And Mama and Papa would read it, and they always burned it when they finished. But Anne Marie heard Mama and Papa talking about it sometimes at night about the news that they had heard, news of sabotage against the Nazis, bombs hidden and exploding in factories that made war materials, railroad lines torn up so the, the Nazis couldn't move their weapons from place to place. And she knew what the resistance was too because Papa had told her. The resistance fighters were Danish people. Nobody knew who they were. 
but they were very secret and brave and they wanted to fight the Nazis in any way that they could. They would damage German ships and trucks and cars and bomb their factories. They were very brave and sometimes they were caught and killed. I need to go talk to Ellen, Mrs. Rawson said. You girls walk home a different way tomorrow. Promise me, Anne Marie, and I'll make Ellen promise too. We will, Mrs. Rawson, but what difference does it make? There's soldiers everywhere. But these ones will remember your faces, Mrs. Rawson said. It's important to be part of the crowd. Always just be one of the crowd and don't give them any reason to ever remember you. He'll remember my face, Mama, Kirsty said, because he said I look like his little girl, that I'm pretty. If he has such a pretty little girl, why doesn't he go home to her? Mama said, rubbing Kirsty's cheek. Mom, is there anything to eat? Anne Marie asked, trying to make her mom think about something besides the soldiers. Get some bread and get a piece for your sister too. With butter? No butter, Mama said. You know that. Kirsty sighed as Anne Marie went to the bread box. I wish I could have a cupcake. A cupcake with pink frosting on it. A big yellow cupcake with pink frosting. Mama laughed. For a little girl, Kirsty, you have a good memory. There, haven't, there hasn't been butter or sugar for cupcakes in a long time. At least a year. When will there be cupcakes again? Kirsty asked. When the war ends, Mama said. And then she looked out the window down at the street where the soldiers stood. When the soldiers go home, Mama said. So that's the end of chapter one. So here's some things we've learned. The Nazis have invaded this country and they're taking stuff like butter, tea, coffee, sugar, things like that, and the soldiers are everywhere. And apparently, Mrs. Rawson, Ellen's mom, and Anne Marie and Kirsty's mom are kind of afraid of them. So we'll read chapter two tomorrow called, Who is the Man Who Rides Past? And we'll figure out if we can learn some more information about who the Nazis are, what they're doing there, and why everybody's so scared of them. All right, bye folks.